Amber is the host of the podcast Atheist Lives, which features stories of how people found their way free of religions and other systems of thought control. Ember, pronouns she, they, is an openly transgender person showing her transition as she progresses. A proponent of science, equality, and cutie LGBTQ rights, freedom, including bodily autonomy and reason, she opposes oppressive, repressive, and regressive ideologies like, but not limited to, gender um, criticalism and Christian nationalism. So let's say hi to Ember. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm so glad that you decided to join us. <laughs> yeah, it's a, awesome. wonderful to to be here and see everyone. There's a, there's a bunch of people here. That's pretty neat. <laughs> there are a bunch of people here. We are so glad that everyone has joined us and we're glad that you have joined us too. <laughs> I am so excited to have you on the program. Helen told me about you and I know Helen went on your program a while back and I've been mm -hmm. watching some of your videos and very much enjoyed your channel. So I am well, thank super you. excited. Yeah. Very good content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll, we'll spread those links mm -hmm. at the end. Uh, but uh, Amber, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get here? Oh, goodness. Uh, uh, I'm terrible at autobiography. Um, well, most immediately, because a um, um, mutual friend of ours, uh, Robin Webster, put me in touch with Helen and said, hey, you should do this. Um, so I talked to Helen. Helen was already aware of me because of another mutual friend named Brentley, because I've been on uh, Brentley's YouTube shows a few times. And uh, we just started building it up uh, there's there's a tremendous amount in in common um of course i primarily focus on counter apologetics and, and atheist activism but i've been doing increasingly more trans activism and other lgbtq issues um partly because of my own transition but also partly because of the culture that's been getting progressively more aggressive progressively aggressive yeah let's go with that and uh yeah it's it we need to stand up and be visible because it's the only way that the people who are like us but can't speak up, who don't have the platform, who don't have the the safety to do so, know that they're not alone, that it isn't a world full of red hat wearing torch wielders who want to burn them at the stake. Yeah, well, and thank you for being part of those voices that are not the burn people at the stake. Uh, folks, I completely agree that we do need more of that, and that's one of the things we try to provide here as well, is a safe place for people to land if they are coming out of some mm -hmm. of these beliefs or kind of questioning where they are. So absolutely, we appreciate your work on that front. Now, I understand that you have some comments to tell us about uh, regarding uh, transitions life transitions and uh being being your authentic self would you like to uh dive into that sure I, i've put together a, a short presentation i'm i'm no seth andrews but i'll i'll do my best no one <laughs> is well no he's the is. bar that we're all trying to achieve <laughs> so, <laughs> life goals yes life goals I hope to someday be able Atheist to put life people to sleep goals. with my voice. <laughs> Tell Seth, I'm gonna tell Seth he's our guru. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, In considering we're we're yeah we're largely non-believers or mm -hmm. or at least you know secular focused people, mm -hmm. and yet we have so many uh, gurus and goddesses and queens and cult leaders and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. It's it we do it all for fun, but it just strikes me as really amusing mm -hmm. that there's so many of these pseudo religious figures running around the community. <laughs> Well, and that's an interesting point too. The way maybe we uh, we have a sort of a a lexicon that we use to describe important people in our lives that maybe derives from some of this religious the religious language. language. Yeah, yeah, maybe we need mm -hmm. to come up with some better titles for these folks. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be next week's poll, maybe. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Amber, please go ahead, dazzle us. Oh, or well, just so share some set the expectation right up there for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, today I'm going to talk about the similarities between trying to live as a secular person in a largely non-secular world and trying to live as a trans person in a largely an accepting world. 
it's a lot more than the same antagonist for both. And by that, I mean the, the methods used by religious apologists, misunderstanding science, cherry picking long debunked hypotheses while pretending all the rest of science doesn't exist, straight up lying and emotional manipulation, all built on, on a foundation of nothing more than wishful thinking are exactly the same tactics used by gender criticals. The upside is that you can use the same tools that we use for counter apologetics to debunk transphobes too. In the same vein, the tools for becoming who you really are once you're free of indoctrination's influence are very similar as well. So we're going to explore what we have in common and some things that we can learn from each other. First thing first, transitions. They aren't just for trans people. Consider puberty. It's a long, gradual process that moves you from childhood to being an adult. Child you is you, but adult you is even more you. We all do this all the time. Most people are going through several kinds of transitions simultaneously, always evolving into a more authentic version of oneself. We learn, we grow, and we become more. Escaping religion is a transition too. Just like a gender transition, it's usually a slow journey composed of many gradual steps. Sure, a few people have a breakthrough moment when they suddenly realize the whole thing is nonsense. Once you see the man behind the curtain, you can't go back to believing in the wizard. But then there's the long road of recovery, rebuilding that part of your identity that religion formerly occupied. For everyone else, it's an incremental process. Perhaps we discover that the Earth isn't really 6,000 years old, or Noah's flood never happened, and so we call Genesis a myth, but keep the faith generally. Later it dawns on us that if Genesis is fiction, original sin doesn't exist, so what is the point of Jesus? Or perhaps we face a moral crisis. If Jesus' message was all about love and inclusion, why is so much of the work of churches all about hate, oppression, and exclusion? Perhaps the churches are wrong, you might think. Maybe there are other churches who do better, and surely the ideals that Jesus taught are worth keeping. And so we go step by step until we eventually realize that we don't need faith to be a good person. In fact, faith all too often holds us back from being as good as we could be. Not everybody makes it all the way out. There are a lot of things holding people back from taking that last step towards freedom. A big one is fear. Fear of hell. Fear of not seeing loved ones after we die. Fear of death itself. Also, fears in the real world, loss of community, rejection by family, even losing a job, housing, and other resources we need to live are still a very real problem in many parts of the world, including the United States. These parallel a lot of the difficulties transgender and LGBT folk generally face with their own coming out. Rejection by family and friends, loss of community, loss of employment, housing, legal trouble, even direct violence. It's scary to be open about who you really are in a world where force of every kind is being used to compel you to be something else. But what do you do once you've taken that step? How do you know who you even are once you've shed the mask of who you were forced to pretend to be? Both of these are very personal journeys and really are just different kinds of transition and they both spring from the core of a person's identity. Who are you? It can take a long time to discover that. Many people have been repressing their nature for so long, some things can come as a surprise. It's not unusual for a few things to become apparent instantly, often things close to the surface, but other things can take years to figure out, come to terms with, or adapt to. Fear of hell is a big one that many of the people who talk to me stay hung up on for a very long time. It's easy for us to convince the intellect it's an irrational fear. We aren't even a little bit afraid of going to hell in another religion because there's no reason to. No former Christian is worried about Hindu hell, which might be a downgrade in one's next incarnation to something especially unpleasant. No former Hindu is concerned about what Allah might do to their soul, because they're in the same place relative to Islam as they were before, and it didn't bother them then. Since we don't fear those things we don't believe in, why should we be bothered by this particular thing that we don't believe in? But the thing about being human is our emotions don't really care about what's rational or reasonable. Fear isn't a cognitive response, so we can't use our big eight brains to reason our way out of it. That's exactly why religions and the social structures they enforce so freely make use of it. 
It's one more lever of control that isn't vulnerable to critical thinking. It's one more reason not to trust them. That's true for trans people as well. We have a lot of irrational fears programmed into us by mother culture. We've all been indoctrinated and overcoming that, deprogramming yourself, takes a long time. Have patience with yourself and don't be afraid to seek help. There are people out there who are just like you, who don't want to be controlled by the manipulations of others and just want to be free to be themselves. People who have to be free when you get right down to it. Because while some humans are very good at lying to themselves, many of us are not. And none of us can really be happy while we're doing that. The next steps are filling the holes in your life. Humans are a social species, and our connections to others define a huge part of our experiences. Consider the loss of a loved one, not a family member you're obligated to mourn necessarily, but someone you care very deeply about. The intensity of the grief you feel is because of the strength of the connection you shared. That's one of the things that helps me deal with grief, to tangent for just a moment. When a loss hurts a hell of a lot, the silver lining is that I can consider myself fortunate to have had such a powerful connection. When we're dealing with the loss of a whole community, however, it can be overwhelming. Whether that's because we've left the church or because we've come out as queer or trans, some people will reject us. It will hurt. But here's the upside. Some people won't. Perhaps one or two members of your former congregation will make an effort to remain part of your life. Perhaps more. Perhaps some of your family will still accept you. Perhaps all of them. Perhaps people at your job won't even care or might even support you. The people who choose to stick with you are the real ones, as they say, and now you know that they are. As for the rest, maybe consider them dodged bullets because they weren't really there for you in the first place. It still sucks. I really, really know but sometimes realizing they actually are shitty people and you actually are better off can help a bit. Only once you rip off that duct tape holding you back can you really start to heal and eventually start to grow. And hear me on this. The person you'll become once you let yourself blossom will blow your past self's mind. I've seen it more times than I can count, and it never stops being amazing. Discovering new things about yourself can be a lot like an epiphany. It can be sudden, powerful, and fill you with a sense of peace, bliss, confidence, and more. That's not always the case, of course. Some things you learn the same way you always have. Huh, I like broccoli, apparently. But sometimes it comes out of the blue and hits you like a tidal wave of wonder. For example, one of the first things I did after deciding to start transitioning was to go get my ears pierced. I wanted to do it because I wanted dangly ear decorations. It was a means to an end, not a goal itself. But when it was done and the piercer held up the mirror so I could see, I was overcome by a wave of euphoria so intense I started to cry right in the chair. It turns out it was something that I had always wanted, but it had been so deeply suppressed for so very long, I didn't even realize it was suppressed anymore. And to finally have something you'd actually convinced yourself you could never have, that can rock your boat. Experiences like that make me wonder what else I've been hiding from me. And that's part of the joy of self-discovery. You get to know yourself in ways that you can't even imagine at the start. The same thing happens with deconversion, too. I like to mention Owen from Telltale here because he's such a wholesome example. As a former Jehovah's Witness, he was never allowed to celebrate Christmas. Now that he's free, even though he's an atheist, he can't get enough of Christmas. The lights, the decorations, the silly traditions, he's all about it. Part of it, I'm sure, is that it's just plain cool. But part of it is the personal symbolism. He's free, and he can live however the heck he wants. Isn't it interesting that so many people say without religion, everyone will just go wild? Well, it turns out that we don't start living like we're in the Purge movies. Our real deepest desires are to put up Christmas trees and get prettier. The horror. So 
a big part of any transition is learning about the you that's been under the mask you took off. That's not to say we have to do it all on our own. Some hurdles are harder to clear than others, and it is a long process, whatever the nature of your transition. You're going to need friends, particularly ones with experience in the kinds of struggles you're facing. You're going to need a community that fits this new chapter in your life. I also suggest to everyone that you find a therapist, if you can. As a lifelong poor person, I know better than most that access to any kind of mental health care is a hallmark of privilege. That said, many of us are carrying around a lot of emotional baggage we may not even realize is there, and I firmly believe that everyone can benefit from therapy. Even if you don't feel like you're struggling, it can still be an immense help. And that leads to another area of commonality. Trauma. One of the most common things the deconverted have to deal with is religious trauma. To be clear, if that's you, you are not alone. Those still in the faith often have it too, but it's harder to deal with while you're still actively denying that it's a problem. It's the same for trans people. While you're in denial, you can often deny the trauma you've experienced really is a problem. But once you're out, you have to deal with the reality of it. That's kind of the big drawback of escaping any kind of indoctrination. You have to deal with reality now. Crap. Some of this stuff is a lot harder than others, and what affects you and how severely is something each of us has to discover for ourselves. For example, the evangelicals have this central thesis that all humans are horrible, wicked beings at their core who can never be good enough. I'm deliberately understating how intense the self-hatred drilled into people is because I don't want to trigger a trauma response in a viewer if I can help it. But it isn't just the idea. It's what springs from it. People endure abuse of every kind and never say a word because they've been convinced that they don't deserve to be treated well. Or they're threatened into silence because their attacker uses this abnegation of the self against them. Despite the fact that this indescribably harmful belief is beaten into little children, sometimes literally, because God's glory requires child abuse it seems, some people manage to shrug it off with no lasting problems at all. Other people suffer varying levels of distress up to and including a propensity to self-harm, even years after deconversion. Wherever you might fall on that spectrum, please remember to be kind to yourself. You didn't ask for that, and it isn't part of who you are. Be patient with yourself. Stuff like that can take a long time to work through. A parallel on the trans side of things that might be toxic gender expectations. These ideas, often promoted by religion, of course, that real men don't cry or real women always submit to their husbands or even there are only two genders for those of us who don't fall squarely on one of the poles in the bimodal distribution of the gender spectrum. This kind of thing gets insisted upon from every angle. Church, family, spouses, workplaces, and to a still shockingly great extent, even the general culture. They're so prevalent that even those of us who were never part of religion to begin with still wind up internalizing these damaging ideas. And again, it isn't just the idea itself, but the idea in practice. People are hurt and that harm is justified based on shitty concepts like these. And it isn't just trans people they harm. Cis women who start deconstructing this kind of indoctrination start to realize that they don't have to be pure, and they aren't responsible for what other people do to them. Cis men find they aren't carnal animals totally unable to control their own behaviors, and they can feel emotions besides rage. And non-binary people, well, we might be the most surprised of all to discover that by gum we do exist. How about that? There's a lot to say on this subject, um, enough for another talk entirely. The point, however, is that whether directly or indirectly, indoctrination leaves a mark on our identities. And when that mark is traumatic, deconstructing it to discover who you really are underneath is even harder. So don't be harsh on yourself. If something hurts you, it hurts you, even if it doesn't seem to be a big deal to others. There are things you may have not had to struggle with that others are having a hard time with. 
we're all different in both our experiences and how the scars on our hearts have formed. So how we all heal is going to be unique. One thing that has helped me a lot and may be of use to others is to focus on the present and look forward to the future. We mustn't ignore the past. Healing requires dealing with those traumas, but we don't have to make it the main thing running through our minds on a daily basis either. For example, I'm still getting used to the idea that I can feel good about myself. It may sound strange to some of you, but I didn't even know what that meant until I started my transition. I thought I did, but the best I could manage was feigning pride in my beard, which was the shield I hid behind for a very long time, and I suspect many of the people who watch my videos knew that. I was very uncomfortable with compliments because I was very uncomfortable with the version of me that was being complimented, if you see. It was rather like wearing a cotton sweater and having people say what a marvelous cotton plant I was. Thanks, but I'm not a cotton plant and your recognition of me as such just doesn't compute. Now, when people tell me nice things, I can wonder if they're just being kind and feel insecure about it like a normal person, but I can accept it and feel happy. And I find I actually quite like compliments. So I'm living in the moment, wrapping my head around this remarkable state of being so vastly different from what I knew before, but also accepting what came before was different all while looking forward to the steps yet to come where I'll look even better as myself and how wonderful that will be. Now, on to the things that we can learn from each other. This is by no means a comprehensive list, just a couple of things I've noticed. For one thing, the secular community does a much better job of building community. We can speculate on why that is, but the state of things is that there are functioning communities within the secular space, places where people can find a home, whether online or in person, where they're welcomed, wanted, and missed when they aren't around, where people care about others' lives, celebrate their successes, and commiserate their hardships, where people care. That's not to say that nobody in the trans community or the LGBT community generally just that there aren't obvious hubs for community, like the ACA or the line community or Skeptic Haven and so on. Or if there are, they're unfortunately fairly well hidden. Instead, communities on, among trans groups tend to form around individual creators, fan clubs, basically. But the problem there is they only get the chance to interact when that particular creator is active. If they take a break or retire, that community is left adrift. Additionally, they tend to be more influenced by specific creators than might really be wise because of the situation. There are transphobic trans people out there with fairly big audiences. And if you want to be part of the group, you need to toe the party line. And then we're back to the dangers of indoctrination and internalizing harmful messaging. I suspect that's part of the reason we see so much LGBT participation in the secular spaces, because half of the secular population tends towards secular humanism, so they tend to be accepting of anyone of similar inclination. On the flip side, trans people are a lot more active in activism. We do protests, parades, lawsuits, and all kinds of things to get public attention onto issues that affect us. We don't always win, but we're visibly fighting the oppressors. Now, don't get me wrong, the secular community doesn't just lay down and die when the religious people start trying to impose their beliefs on everyone by laws or policies. But what was the last time you saw a news story about a bunch of atheists blocking traffic at the Oklahoma State Capitol protesting Prager U being put into the classrooms? Maybe that's happened, but I haven't heard about it. And that right there is the problem. We need to be more visible. Frankly, we should all be even more visible, but this is about what these two communities can learn from each other. If you're listening to this, this is a great topic to weigh in on in the comments, constructive suggestions to help us all build a better tomorrow. These communities aren't just support groups for people with similar life experiences. They're manifestations of the will to transition our civilization into a freer, safer society so that those who come after us don't have to suffer the way we did. 
No one should have to suffer to be who they are. And I'll close with this. Whether you're trans or rebuilding your life after faith, these are both transitions and they're done for the same reason. You need to be kind to yourself while you figure out who you are because until now, you've been told who to be. I love that. Thank you for having... I, I feel like... You really put together some really good points there, Ember, and it's it's amazing to me that I come away feeling so positive uh, from your comments, even though these are these are difficult topics, uh, and you're talking about you know some really tough life changes um, that you've gone through that other people are going through, and I I really like the way that you've thought this through in terms of you know what can we do to support one another and be a larger community together. I think that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I want to keep picking your brain on this topic. We have some more time with you and uh, we are definitely going to get into it. Uh, one of the things that that I notice on your site is you kind of talk about uh, you have content that has to do with science, reason, humanism, skepticism, but also you really emphasize the other side of things like creativity and inspiration uh, from a secular perspective. Could you tell us a little more about what you see as kind of the intersection between those two sort of fields of of experience or knowledge and, and what they bring to the conversation when you put them together? Well, it's, uh, I suppose it's kind of what I consider to be the power of the divine within human beings. Um, gods have the power to create. Well, that's a power we have. In fact, that's really the only power we have. We create language, we create mathematics, we create tools, we create lots of things. We're actually fairly good at it. We come up with some bad ideas from time to time, but the inspiration, the creativity, that's our superpower as a species. It's not just tool use. It's not just language. It's the creativity that gives rise to all the things that we do. And so... I see that as kind of a, a substitute for a God, something better than a God. Don't do what a God tells you to do. Do what your heart calls you to do. Oh, I like that. Ooh. And so what, what would you say led you to realize that um, you had maybe not been being you or actually, mm -hmm. you know, going with what your heart told you you were as a person? How did, was that connected to you with uh, a religious belief? Was it separate from that? How did, was this something you had always known and just hadn't uh, really had the opportunity to explore? How did this all come about? Uh, yeah, I was I, pretty much, I was wearing a mask for most of my life. <laughs> I, I knew I was a trans person at least age three, possibly sooner for sure mm -hmm. at three, but I didn't have the words to describe what that was until I was in my 20s. And, uh, you know, by then I was married and uh, my spouse was very much not accepting. <laughs> so I was kind of stuck being, you know, growing up, I was told you can't do that. That's, that's girl things. You have to do boy things. Uh, don't hang out with the girls. You have to hang out with the boys and all, all that, that nonsense. And you know, at a certain point, it gets beaten into you. You just have to go along and play the role just to make life suck a little bit less, even though you're desperately unhappy. But then as you get older, you start to read about things. The internet became a thing while I was coming of age. And, and you know, suddenly I was like, oh, I'm not a total freak. There are other people like me. There's all kinds of interesting people. There's gay people and there's bi people and there's lesbians and there's asexual people and there's, there's gender fluid people. There's so many interesting flavors of humanity. Why on earth our civilization makes it out to be like this? Just vanilla is the only flavor. I don't understand, but I, I do digress. It's a, it's a terrible habit of mine. Um, yeah, religion-wise, my grandmother kept trying to bring me to churches, but I was one of those annoying kids who kept asking questions, and so they would ask her not to bring me again, and then we'd try another church, and we'd try another church, and I, I was I was just incorrigible. Um, eventually, she gave up. 
she wasn't the only one who tried. My school district was one of those where you had the the option to get out of school and go to church on certain days of the week, and everyone else did it because they wanted to get out of school, but I didn't. So oftentimes it was me and a teacher in a classroom, and the teacher was not happy about the fact they couldn't go sneak off to the teacher's room, which they would normally do when all the kids were gone because the kids weren't all gone. I was, I was very unhelpful that way, but, you know... Um, but no, Christianity never really stuck. I did eventually become a minister uh, with the Universal Life Church. I got into the, the, the philosophy. I was trying to reason out how a soul could actually exist, um, what, what a soul mm -hmm. might be, how gods might be real, and every religion might be correct. And I came up with this idea that if you consider the soul to be the animating force, you know, Aristotle's version of the soul, it's, it's what lets you move your body at your will the, or, or keep your consciousness running whatever, however you want to characterize that. But if you imagine it as, as this, this uh, jello-like entity existing on the spiritual plane, just to throw words out there for visualization purposes, when you believe in a God, you're taking a part of your spiritual energy and you're dedicating it to that idea. You're, you're cutting off a little bit of your jello and setting it over here in this area that's, that's Yahweh or Allah or Vishnu or Odin or what have you. That's not a whole lot of spiritual energy, but if you multiply that by millions of believers, suddenly you have a very large ball of spiritual jello with no physical body. So it has the capacity to animate things in the world because that's what a soul is, but it has no body. That sounds a lot like a god to me, but... You know, so I wrote that up and uh, I published it in, in some New Age magazine. I can't even remember because it was way back in 1999. But the Universal Life Church read that and they were like, listen, uh, we don't want to get into the theology of whether or not gods might actually exist. But our deal is that we believe that if a person believes in a religion, then that religion is true for them. And it kind of jived with me. So, you know, I joined them and, and we tried to, you know, do the whole peace and, and you know, there are many roads up the mountain, um, all that sort of thing. But I never really got invested in any of the ideologies. It was more a general philosophy of humanism. Um, but at a certain point, I, I just couldn't do the thing with the, oh, yeah, if you believe it, it's true. Because there was so much of that, that critical thinking, that skepticism of... How do we know it's true, though? Like, how do we know any of it's true? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So it just didn't stick around for me. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's an evolution. It's a transition. for uh, you, mm -hmm. Even us not never theists. <laughs> no, it's like really it, funny. When, when you were talking about um, religion infecting people that have never been religious. My husband is a huge um, death metal... Um, fan and when he was a um in his he was in college and he started listening to slayer and he had a moment of like well if i listen to this does that mean demons are going to infect me <laughs> and he's not he has no beliefs in any way but it was just because it was during the satanic panic and you know these messages were getting out into the world and he had like you know a moment of you know is this going to be like, is there any going to be some kind of negative force upon me? So you sometimes forget that, you know, those of us that are always talking against, like, you know, bad ideas and bad beliefs that, and those of us that have come from religion forget that, you know, we understand on a political spectrum because, you know, Christian nationalism is a thing, but the average person who isn't brought up in any religion, you know, they can be progressive and still have those bad ideas as, as a part of their reality and it's just because it's just so much a part of um our culture especially as westerners <laughs> mm -hmm. it, exactly it's not just the west either like uh yeah. um there was a period in the the 70s almost up to 1980 in iran where where the country was virtually secular but because there was that muslim influence in the culture a lot of muslim mores uh, permeated everyday life, even for non-believers. And then their wave of conservatism came and, and the Ayatollah and, and all that stuff. And oof. But you could see 
the 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 ideas from the religion permeating the culture and similar thing in india where even secular people are still subject to just the the thinking that pervades hinduism um it it happens everywhere where there's a dominant religion it's only in the the places of intersectionality um like um the metropolitan melting pots i suppose like london new york city hong kong and so forth where you really get people have the 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 ability to see the different cultural facets that are produced by religion versus what's actually part of the 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 secular culture their their national heritage rather than their religious heritage got it okay so i've got a follow up question that I don't know why, but something you were talking about made me think of this, and this may be a tangent, so y'all reel me back in if we get too far off on this tangent, but um, you were talking a little bit about the the, the realm of the spiritual jello, and I, I don't know, it got me thinking about, uh, I know on your channel you've been following uh, some things like the uh, the solar eclipse, it's a solar eclipse, right, uh, and uh, you, you make mention of... Uh, uh, astronomy sometimes are you an astronomer do you have uh, and does a uh, kind of a uh, study of the universe and uh, science in general uh, kind of inform your your sense of wonder or creativity or inspiration in any way to a large extent uh yeah i i, I originally wanted to be an astrophysicist but it's a long story. TLDR, there aren't physics jobs in my area. So I had to pick something else or move, which my then spouse would not do. She would not move. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was situation. Um, but that that was my first choice of, of adult career because I've always loved the stars. It's a uh, that's actually my primary source for that sense of numinous when people feel the the burning in the bosom that they de describe as a religious experience, looking up into the vastness of the cosmos and seeing the globular clusters and 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 you know the uh, the the various constellations we've laid out, like uh, you know Orion with the three stars and and uh, knowing there's that nebula under there. I've done astrophotography too, trying to you know get images like that. Um, the, the there's just so much wonder. There's so much amazingness out there. One of my, the holiest book I've ever read was a, one of those giant books that happened to be like the first 10 years of Hubble photos and like just leafing through and seeing like the globular clusters in amazing detail and so big and so bright and so many pretty lights. It just, it filled me with that sense of peace and connection with the whole universe. It, it was really like a religious experience for me. That's one of the reasons I'm so much into space. Um, another is because of the, well, the the fight against oppressive ideologies, weirdly enough, because we've all seen uh, virtually every apologist, whether they're, they're you know, Frank Turek or William Lane Craig, all argue, well, the Big Bang points to a creator. And that is very much not true. And it, it really annoys the hell out of me. I'm like, these people know nothing about cosmology and I will crush them <laughs> on this subject. <laughs> well, that, that always bugs me too, when you have people who clearly have all of their background uh, and education and experience and you know prior knowledge and writings are in some completely unrelated field. And all of a sudden one day they've all decided that they need to talk about quantum mechanics uh, as if that proves their point and trot out research articles that do not conclude uh, what they claim they conclude and uh, announcing that uh, astrophysics supports their point. Uh, do you have any uh, any resources uh, that you could point us to, or is this uh, so far beyond the, the scope of uh, what we have time here this evening? But hmm. I don't have a, a collection handy. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's really, really topic specific. Like if you if you want to know uh, more about our galaxy, neighboring galaxies, uh, all the way back to the Big Bang. NASA, uh, ESA.gov. Um, I think it's it's a .gov. Maybe it's not. I don't know. What's uh, ESA? The, uh, the European Space Agency. Oh, 
because so many people don't trust NASA. Thanks, Flat Earthers. Uh, but there are other <laughs> space agencies around the world. Uh, India's got a good space agency, though I don't know the initials off the top of my head. Um, but there's 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 a lot of places like that. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a, a ton of info. He does that Star Talk podcast, of course, but that's there's a lot of episodes and the subjects are random, so you aren't necessarily going to get an answer you might be looking for, but it's often interesting listening. Um, yeah, so there's 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 stuff all over the place, but it, it really depends on what you specifically want to know where the best place to look might be. Oh, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I, I knew we were going to have an opportunity to nerd out, and uh, I'm I'm glad we did it about space. Hell yeah. <laughs> Space. Awesome. space it's so yes. beautiful yes and it's uh it's esa.int i believe is the uh link if my googling serves me correctly ah the the, the, the who needs oracles when we've got googles right google exactly. is the all-knowing god <laughs> professor google knows all Except, you know, you do Google want to be guy. careful mm -hmm. that you uh, don't engage in confirmation bias when you are Googling and just searching for things that you agree with and assuming they are true. We do want to Actually, that's a great way to, to sharpen your critical thinking skills mm -hmm. is when you encounter an idea that you, f you notice yourself automatically uncritically agreeing with or you encounter an idea like Flat Earth, for example, that you automatically uncritically dismiss. That's an opportunity to look up what the other side is saying. I, I had a debate teacher in high school who used to say, if you can't articulate the other side's argument, you don't really understand it. So looking at the other side on any given issue is a great way to, to really enhance your own critical understanding in general, but on that topic specifically. Hmm. And, and that is something that is very different from... Uh, what a lot of us may have been brought up hearing about, uh, if I know some people in the chat have been mentioning, uh, in their religious communities as a child, they were prevented from accessing uh, not just certain kinds of music or entertainment, but even the internet at all in order to prevent them from encountering these competing ideas. Uh, I think the idea is that if you encounter those ideas, you might believe them. Uh, but your point is that it would be better to actually understand the whole picture and understand both sides of an argument in order to arrive at a true belief, yes? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Although we do have to do it in a responsible fashion. It's, it's unfortunately, a lot of our schools do not teach critical thinking. They do not teach rhetoric. They don't teach understanding of propaganda. And so it's all too easy for a person to uh, say, start Googling flat earth stuff and, you know, watch a flat Zoid documentary or, or a Jaronism film mm -hmm. or whatever, and end up becoming a red hat wearing tinfoil eating anti-vax supporter. It, it just, you go way off the deep end. If you're mm -hmm. not prepared to challenge the ideas that are presented to you, being, being a critical thinker goes both ways. You don't just uncritically accept the other side's ideas either. There was a, a sage many centuries ago. I can't remember the name because I'm bad with names. But he said that the hallmark of intelligence is the ability to contain an idea within your mind without automatically accepting that idea. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. Very cool. Well, and so this might be a good time to talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned uh, doing kind of analyses of debates and apologetics and counter apologetics um what are some i guess some communication uh techniques or tactics or skills um, that you have find found helpful when dealing with competing beliefs and ideas especially if, if people are uh putting up some resistance to maybe changes uh, that you're making in your life or your lifestyle mm -hmm. or your identity um, are there are there better ways than others uh, that you have found for delivering uh, new information and ideas to people? Well, I, I suppose it depends on your goal. If you, whether you want to win the argument or whether you want to, as Shannon Q would say, elevate the discourse and really be understood. 
if you want to win, there's a whole bunch of dirty tricks like emotional manipulation. Uh, you could study up on the fallacies and learn rhetoric yourself. Basically, all the dirty tricks that people like Frank Turek use when they're debating college students or Ben Shapiro's great at it, too. All the fallacies. He's a bloody machine. Um, but if you actually want to be understood, deliberately avoid doing all of those. Be mindful about being deliberately honest and authentic. Explain what you mean in full and counter bad ideas in full. Or, and, and especially important, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I can't, if I had a nickel for every time I've seen a person, even a, a secular advocate, uh, an, an atheist advocate, often on some of the big call-in shows, just go right off the deep end about something they don't know anything about because it just didn't occur to them to say, I don't know about that. It, it's, it's truly remarkable. And that's what gets religious people in trouble because they have this magic book that they pretend has all the answers. So they cannot say, I don't know. And I understand it's cultural contamination. It's the same reason that we stub our toe and go, Jesus Christ, we don't actually believe in Jesus Christ. It's just cultural contamination from the, the, the ambiance of that kind of ideology. But don't ever be afraid to say, I don't know. Because if you don't say, I don't know when you should, it's going to bite you later. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have certainly stuck my foot in my mouth more than once when I- We do that all the time. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and did, did you say I do that all the time? I, you're right. No, I, I said do. I do that. All, no, I mean like, but I do that too. It's because we- we feel the emotion is we feel like we're so sure of ourselves and we understand mm -hmm. something. Uh, everybody falls into this, whether you're religious or not, um, because guess what? Um, we like the, we like to feel right because it makes us feel good. And usually when we're wrong, it makes us uncomfortable and we don't like that. And we will double down on, um, you know, an idea. And then when we're corrected sometimes, or we say something that, you know, um, makes us stick our foot, our foot in our mouth. And I think the idea is, and this is something Car and I kind of emphasize that it is okay to be wrong. And if you are wrong, that means you have something to learn. And if you have something to learn, that means you need to grow. And that's okay. Because <laughs> that's the only way you do grow is to um, learn something you didn't know before and, you know, be like, oh, I was wrong about that. I learned something new today. Okay. And you move on. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's... And, that's one no, of the huge differences between <laughs> science and religion. Now, again, we shouldn't conflate science with atheism, with, with any no. particular uh, value system or whatever. Science is just a mechanism for generating answers to questions in a, in a reliable way. But people, particularly theists, often come at us with like, well, science is changing all the time. How can you trust it? What if you're wrong? Well, I want to know if I'm wrong. Because when I'm wrong, I learn more. That's actually the point. Right. Persisting in a belief despite all the evidence to the contrary doesn't inspire me to think I am likely correct in that belief. <laughs> I would rather uh, be on on the team or, or uh, with the, the people who are going to change their mind if they find out they may be wrong. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points. Well, and so this kind of reminds me of another question I wanted to ask you about, uh, maybe a segue into this. Uh, one of your slogans uh, on your website is, uh, you're better than religion. And I'm wondering, uh, what do you mean by that? Is it uh, something to do with, with this, this ability to change and grow? In, in part, it's a, in a way, this is another thing that's sort of like Seth Andrews in that it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's all the things that it could possibly mean. Um, for instance, you do have the ability to change your mind. You do have the ability to set something that you know is factually in error and set it aside and do better. But also, you're morally better than religion. As uh, um, Eric from Skeptics and Scoundrels pointed out, it doesn't take much to be better than Yahweh, for example. Like, uh, you, could, you could still even do the biblical flood. You could do the flood. You could kill all the humans on earth. All you would have to do is kill one less baby, and you are more moral than that god. So 
everyone, every living human is better than religion. They're more moral than any proposed creator. They're, they're more capable. You're more real. You can demonstrate your own existence. I certainly hope you're able to affect the world in ways that I, God has never been able to. Uh, it's, there's, there's a lot to it, but Ultimately, the main takeaway that I want people to get is that they're able to rise above the restrictions placed on them by belief systems that were imposed on them. I really like that. And that's something that you've been uh, kind of telling us about this whole time, I think, with all of these, you know, different ways that people may change their minds or various transitions that we may go through in our lives. Uh, do, could you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the ways that as you've been going through your gender transition, uh, for example, um, some ways that you have found that you're able to be a better version of yourself now that you're not under those previous restrictions? It, it's interesting that that, that comes up. Um, I wanted the YouTube channel. It's called Better Than Ember because I'm Ember and it's better than religion. I wanted to do better than religion, but that name was already taken. So I went, screw it. I'll be better than Ember. And uh, as as I've started to actively pursue a transition and start to make my way through it, um, I find that I am becoming better than the previous Ember. I'm much more myself. I'm much, much happier. Like so much so that to say I'm much happier does not even describe the difference. It's freaking amazing. Um and it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's sort of like what I'm trying to show other people is that by getting all the crap out of the way and going for it, trying to be the best you that you can be can, it's, it's challenging as hell. It's scary as hell. It's, it's dangerous. Um, and it, and, and there's a lot of pain along the way. I have lost so many friends and, and, you know, my channel is actually shrinking. I didn't, ex I expected growth to slow. I didn't expect it to start shrinking <laughs> because people are just like, oh, I don't want to talk about any of that woke trans nonsense. I'm going to put them on my red hat and go to CPAC, you know, that sort of thing. I didn't expect it in the secular community. Maybe I should have because we're all human, but whatever. So there's a lot, a lot of downsides, but on the flip side, none of that freaking matters because it's a thing I have to do. It's for the, fr okay. Um, this weekend I was reminding the kids of certain things in case anything ever happens to me. Like my pin, uh, for my bank account is this and, and you know, my, my password to get onto my main computer is that. And you know, the kids are like, are, are you expecting something to happen? And I'm like, I'm kind of low key terrified every time I go to the store that I might get murdered in the parking lot. But when I, I dropped them off for the night, um, you know, we did hugs and everything and, and they said, Hey, you know, don't do anything drastic. And I'm like, why, <laughs> why would you think that? Like for, for the first time that I can remember, I actually like being alive. This is very new for me. So no, I'm not going to do anything silly. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and, you know, you, you bring up a really good point, though, um, too. Uh, well, actually, a few good points um, that we could probably unpack, which is um, I love that that your family is supportive of you and caring about you and concerned for your well-being, first of all. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I know that's one of the things that that for a lot of people can make all the difference. So I want to recognize how yeah, awesome that yeah. is. Yeah, my, my oldest, it's a, so in order to start the transition, um, it wasn't just finding a workplace where I wouldn't be, you know, immediately murdered. Um, it, it, it was a lot of factors. Like like I mentioned before, uh, the, the kid's other parent, not supportive, not possible to do anything while we were together. So there's there's a lot of things. I needed a lot of ducks in a row to even make it possible. But my kids are wonderful beings. My oldest is actually an inspiration. I had never publicly come out, even as non-binary, until my oldest came out to me and said, I, I, I have to tell you something. I don't know how you're going to react. I hope you won't hate me, but I need to say this. 
and you know, I let them say their piece and I'm like, actually, I, I have always felt the same way. And I told them about when I was little and I knew that I was a little girl, even though everyone kept telling me I was a little boy now as an adult, as I was talking to them a few years ago, um, I felt like non-binary was the best I could do. Not that there's nothing illegitimate about non-binary. I still consider my gender expression to be non-binary, even though I'm very much into the femme side of things at the moment because I haven't had the ability to do that ever before. But, you know, I was saying I, I'm, I'm trans too. I've just never been able to be who I am. And so my youngest coming out kind of set another stone rolling that eventually built up into an avalanche that it wasn't just that. It was some of the wonderful people I've met on YouTube. Um, Stephanie Helms, who's frequently on Skeptic Haven, oh, uh, yeah. inspirational in many, many different ways with the history we of, of love trans Stephanie. people and culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, Bumblebee from Hive Psy. Mm. I was terrified about starting my transition. It was very clear at that point that I needed to because I was very miserable. <laughs> like, I did not like my life. I was hoping I would just not wake up one day. I could never bring myself to do anything because I knew it would hurt the kids. But I kept hoping that I just wouldn't wake up one day. Um, And so it, it was really hard. But, uh, you know, Brie... Uh, being a, a trans woman herself, she did one of her, her shows with no makeup. And, and she said it's to show anybody who might be watching that you don't need to look any particular way. You're still you, <laughs> you know, be you. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Wow. A, a yeah. lot of people have been I... tremendously inspirational. Like it's, it's been one of those things that, you know, I keep expressing that um, clothing does not have a gender, like cloth is this cloth. Like it, mm -hmm. it it's made for my form because I haven't have a female form, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't have a gender. It's, it's cloth y'all <laughs> like makeup does not have a gender It is color that you put on your face or on your nails or whatever. And it, like, they don't have genders. But people want to associate certain things with certain types of people because they they like the order, they like the understanding of it because it's nice and simple. And then when you get people that you know are gender fluid or you know they're cis, but they just want to express themselves in different ways, people get uncomfortable because now you're telling me the rules are changing, and I don't want the rules to change because you know, well, if we don't have binaries, you know, it'll be bad things you know chaos you know the it'll be awful and i'm just like slowly roll <laughs> people yeah. can wear and do what they want because guess what it's not doing anything to you that's a you problem <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, you have to consider that it might be a you problem <laughs> um mm -hmm. amber do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you want to share with us before we do questions Oh, I have, I have, I, I can literally talk for two hours without even referencing inspirational material. We would, I, we, we could just go to questions. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. okay. And don't forget about the hangout after this. Um, let me, uh, let me also let people know in the chat where they can find you. Should we share your YouTube channel and your website? Sure. Let that be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's super easy. I already mentioned my YouTube channel is better than Ember. And uh, all of my links, including YouTube uh, and the Discord, the kids are always telling me, tell people about the Discord. They're all on betterthanreligion.com. All right. Well, definitely check those out. And oh, let's go to questions. Yes. They, they know how to do things on the yeah, my kids Yeah, my kids tell me all the time. And I'm like, how? And, and then like my 40-something brain's like, I'm old. Help, mom. <laughs> yes. Help, mm -hmm. help yes. your mother. <laughs> it's literally true. I also run a uh, a comic con in uh, northern New York, and mm -hmm. you know I I can do the actual comic con parts, like the the logistics yeah. and the getting the guests. Force Velka, in fact, was a guest last year, um, and and doing all that stuff. But running the Discord, I had I had to deputize. Two of my kids, my oldest and my youngest. And I'm like, I, I need you to do the thing because I have no freaking idea. <laughs> right. Yes, we, we need help. This is why diversity mm -hmm. of thought and life experience and age is important. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go to questions. And if you have a question for Ember, go ahead and type it in the chat. We'll get through as many as we can before we wrap up and go to the Hangout where we will continue talking. So uh, let's see. Our first question here is, how are your apologetics different from Christian apologetics? So I guess, do you well, take a different kind of approach mm -hmm. or strategy or is it conceptually different? Well, I, it's, it's counter apologetics. So it's, it's not actually apologetics. I'm not making excuses for things that can't be demonstrated or there's no evidence for or whatever. I'm not saying you should believe despite the total lack of evidence because of X reason. I'm taking the apologetics arguments and showing how they're nonsense. I'm, I'm like, uh, the, the, the watchmaker argument, for example, I'll take that and I'll disassemble it and, and show why it's junk because, uh, in that particular case, the premise is that you're walking along on a beach or through a forest or whatever, all this nature, and you come across a watch. What are you to think? Well, it's designed, it's different. It, it must've been put there by a creator. Therefore, all of the natural world, which is distinct from the watch because it's natural and not a created thing, must have been created. Like just in the way it's posed, the whole thing falls apart. But you can go okay. much deeper too. <laughs> it, it, it's it's a long thing. Um, but yeah, it that's counter apologetics. It's taking apologetics arguments and showing why they're dishonest. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And that's that's definitely an example of one that that I remember hearing a lot of times. So that is certainly a, a relevant conversation, I would say. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Helen, what else do we have? All right. So kind of, um, you know, jumping off the previous question, what are some of the ways that you have been able to better yourself, better be a better version of yourself sans religion? Hmm. Let me repeat that. <laughs> well, like, like I said, religion never really stuck for me. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandmother tried Christianity. Um, I tried universalism. I went through a period where I was trying to get into Wicca and paganism. In fact, I, I have this tattoo. Uh, I don't know if I can get my shoulder visible. It's a, it's a lightning bolt because mm -hmm. my father and I tried to do the anthropology to get back to what the original religion was mm -hmm. and uh long story but the tldr is that it was basically ancestor worship for most cultures and mm -hmm. as the cultures started to say we do this in the name of our fathers who came before eventually got shortened to we do this for our father who is the personification the amalgamation of all our fathers and we eventually come to the modern age. The lightning bolt represents um, a period of time when there were effectively three primary gods, uh, earth, sea, and sky. Fire, that's the Greeks. The Greeks had the four elements. Everybody else did three elements, earth, sea, and sky. And fire represented the fusion of the physical and the spiritual, much like a uh, breath of life is caused by wind and, and mm. you know, energy is not the same as matter, all this sorts of stuff. Three was a, a big thing in many, many, many Paleolithic religions and, and early modern human religions. Um, and the general thesis of how things tended to run, there are some notable exceptions, but the general pattern was that the sea brought forth life, but <laughs> also was full of chaos and rage. And we see that in, in uh, the Genesis story, which is a clone of the uh, uh, Babylonian story of, of Marduk, who came and slew Tiamat, who is the goddess of chaos and the waters and split the waters from the waters and half of it created the earth and the ocean and half of it made the dome of the sky. Genesis is just a ripoff of Marduk. Um, same thing, the, 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 the sea is the origin of life the beginning of things, but also full of rage and chaos. The mm. earth is where things grow. It's it's the nurturing power. It's it's where the forests are, where the agriculture is, where many of the tasty animals are, so on like that. The earth can try to kill us, earthquakes, volcanoes and such, but less so than the ocean with its hurricanes and whatnot. And then there's the sky, the sky watching over all. And 
the sky tended to be the the learning, the wisdom personification. All these ancient gods are personifications of ideas or concepts or things that humans do because that's what humans do is we tell stories, we make stuff up. And so the sky god, um, having all the knowledge, saw these, these very clever primates like whacking sticks and, and stones to make tools and whatnot and was like oh if only if only they were just a little bit smarter i would not be so alone i would have other intellects to share ideas with and commune with and talk to and so forth and so he saw being a wise sky god with all this knowledge saw what was necessary and pulled a prometheus and used a lightning bolt from the sky to ignite fire on the ground and gave humans the gift of fire which was what was necessary to launch the rise of civilization the the intellectualization of humanity mm -hmm. so that now we can be the equal of that great sky god who has all the knowledge or at least strives for more knowledge that sort of deal hence the lightning bolt Long story, I know, but that's, to get back to the actual question, that's how religious ideas have kind of shaped my evolution as a person, even though I myself have never really been religious. I Listen. love that you put that much thought into a yeah. tattoo. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always say, if you're going to get a tattoo, it's like getting married, because it's going to cost a lot of money, it's probably going to cost some pain. And it's going to be lifelong. And if you get it and if you decide that you don't want it anymore, it's going to be super painful and also very expensive. So please make sure that you want to make a lifelong commitment. <laughs> well, that's there, there that's are every ways tattoo to I've ever things. done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I The first tattoo art, artist, uh, that was my first tattoo. And uh, he said that tattoos should never be frivolous. It should be, it should yeah. be art that you want on your body for a reason because you're going to be stuck with it. But there are ways to undo virtually everything. I don't mean just lasers. You can do cover-ups. You can do alterations. There's there's all sorts yeah. of possibilities. I have, I have a couple cover-ups on some of my work just because um, I, I transitioned, you know, in different parts. Again, and I went through a life transition and I uh, decided mm -hmm. I was like, this doesn't serve me anymore. So, you know, and, every, and that's, but of what the ones I do have, even when I, from when I was pagan to who I am now, um, it, it, it tells the story of my life and I, and the ones that I have now, I don't regret. And every time I look at them and I'm like, oh, and they bring me joy. So. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. let's do a couple of more questions. Um, <laughs> so you may have touched on this a little bit already, but, uh, you can expand on it if you want to. Someone is asking, what resources did you use for reflecting on and evaluating your new beliefs and values after leaving religion? And it's a two-part question. How do you embrace your true non-religious self and get to know yourself outside of religion if you're living at home or maybe you're financially dependent on family or still having to attend religious services uh, to please other people? Well, we like I said, I I wasn't I wasn't really in a religion in the first place, so I I didn't n utilize resources to get out of religion. Really, it was just my brain. Like I kept asking mm. questions. Um, when I was a little kid, I was insufferable. Um, because weirdly, I actually tried reading the Bible. Now, certain parts of it I just could not get through, like all the begots and begots and begots and so forth. <laughs> but there there were other periods, like uh, um. It's later in Exodus. I forget the exact chapter and verse. I've never been that kind of minister. Um, but after they, the, the Israelites raise up the golden calf and Yahweh wants to just smite all of them, you know, to, to mm -hmm. hell with these people. They're, they're, they're a, they're a stiff naked people. I will not tolerate it. And Moses is like, your holiness, your holiness. You can't do that. And Yahweh's like, who are you to tell me what to do? And he goes, no, 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 listen, hear me out, bro. Um, what will the other gods think? You can't smite all the Israelites because what will the other gods think? And so I'd ask that question to, to pastors and deacons and so forth. I'd be like, how can you say he's the one true God when he's worried about what the other gods think of him? You know, it doesn't make any damn. And they'd be like, out. <laughs> Don't bring that child back here. <laughs> And that was one of the key indicators that this whole belief system was not true because most of the people didn't know their own belief system. They hadn't really read it. They hadn't thought through any of the logical entailments. And when you confronted them with the stuff that's in their own book, 
not only did they not want to answer, they would kick you out. Not a great sign. That, that is not a great yeah. sign. I Yeah, I, I got in trouble a few times for asking the wrong questions at religious school. They don't like that. They don't like that. I, I got, um, I, I grew up Catholic and I didn't go to a whole lot of Bible study when I was growing up, but I ended up going to a Baptist one and because, um, one of my friends was Baptist and I, I, I asked them questions because they were promoting, um, the, um, the argument that God, you know, created everything, which the Catholic church does not teach. And I, and I was like, how did he do that? <laughs> and I go, how, then how is evolutionist? I think, cause this is when I was, you know, a little bit older and they, they didn't like those questions. <laughs> no, don't think they did not like them. It. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see. We have, I think we have time for one more question. Helen, mm -hmm. do we have one more? I know we have more than one more, but. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. Okay. Um, how do you deal with your close friends? In my personal experience, I have to go back a little just to find common ground and they are great, but it feels like if they haven't heard enough about a topic, but um, nothing seems to bring that is brought up to actively convince them to change their minds. So they're I basically, basically asking, you know, how do you deal with your friends that have um, very different beliefs than you do and trying to find a common ground? <laughs> hmm. Well, it, it's, it's situational specific, but to generalize, I try to find out where they're at. What, what do they believe? Why do they believe that? I, if I really want to convince them, the first thing I'll do is get intensely interested in their side of the position and I'll just listen instead of as soon as somebody makes a point, we have this this urge to correct a bad fact or be like, actually, that's not the case or, or so on and so forth. Just listen to the whole thing and try to take it in and then try to give it back to them. Steel man it. Don't straw man it, but make the best version of their case that you can and say, do I truly understand this? And once they say that you do, then you can start comparing ideas and, and facts and argumentation and things. And, and uh, you know, uh, something like pro-life, for example, very often it's people talking past each other. Pro-choice people don't want to bathe in the blood of the unborn. Pro-life people don't actually want the government making their decisions for them. They've just never thought through all the entailments of their position. If they get what they want, that means the government is making the decisions for them. So once you really understand where they're coming from, then you can show them how they are very much in error. And if you go about it that way, rather than just saying you're wrong because this, you'll just keep talking past each other and nobody's mind will ever get changed. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. I know that comes up a lot here where people are dealing with changing beliefs and going through life transitions like we've talked about, but they want to keep as many of their close relationships as they can. So thinking about how we can preserve those uh, is certainly uh, an important concern. I think you bring up several good points about how to have discourse that is respectful and kind, uh, not just trying to win at an argument. Yeah, I mean, I fail at it myself. Uh all too often. You know, we're humans, we get emotional, we get passionate, we get all kinds of worked up. But it helps to try to keep in mind that no stupid political idea is anywhere near as important as an actual person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People are more important than beliefs. We say that here a lot. It says mm -hmm. it on the back of my shirt right now, but you can't see that. But I know it's there. <laughs> <laughs> you have faith. Well, I, and I saw it before I put it on. Details. <laughs> you know, I, minor, I, minor I, I trust you, Cara, to not, um, you know, pull the wool over mine. So I believe that is what your sweatshirt says. <laughs> it's cotton blend. <laughs> anyway, yeah, like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, no, You're those are great cotton points. play out of Cara. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can't get through it, an episode without some kind of dumb pun. Mm -hmm. so I, I do my best. But, okay, I think that is actually a great point to end on, Ember, and let's go ahead and wrap up. And I know we have more questions, uh, 
Amber, if you have time to stick around for the hangout, we'd love to chat with you further. I, I came for a few more minutes, yeah. Okay, awesome, great. Well, we great. will get right down to it then. Um, I know you have to do other things besides be here with us, but we definitely appreciate your time and appreciate you joining us this evening and sharing all of your insights and thoughts with us. It was really, really good. I really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Awesome. Happy to be yeah. here. Great. And mm -hmm. uh, don't forget, um, everyone else, uh, if you want to see more RFRX episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Just search for Covering From Religion. And don't forget to join us here again next week. Same time, same channel. We'll be back again. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about demonic possessions and exorcisms with mm -hmm. J.D. Sword. That'll be fun. Maybe Ooh. a little spooky. Uh, more demons. And, uh, Demons. Yes, <laughs> we've got a month full of spooky stuff. It would seem because the following we didn't week do that we should have done this for Halloween, but now we're like five I months know. behind. <laughs> yeah, no. we're doing our spooky month. We're now. closing in on Walpurgis Noct, which is you know the 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 opposite pole from Halloween. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <gasps> can we still do spooky things and be celebrating that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in, in a way, a lot of people say that Easter is like the opposite of Halloween. Instead mm. of scary stuff, it's cute stuff. Instead of fall colors, yeah. it's spring colors. But there's still candy, and it's daytime instead of nighttime. But really, Walpurgis Noct isn't just the inverse. It's more of the inverse of Halloween than the opposite of Halloween. Because it's yeah. it can be very, very spooky, too, if you look into the lore behind it. But... That's a whole other talk. I also want to. I also want to keep in mind that Zombie Jesus is coming back from the dead. So yeah, you know, and that's just also spooky. <laughs> that Zombie, Zombie Jesus, Jesus is coming for you. That's right, Zombie Jesus. Instead of eating rings, right. he eats souls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have so many so, Jesuses. So, yes. <laughs> Join us for, for all of that spooky stuff next week and the following. Uh, uh, we'll be talking about mysticism the following week. And uh, Helen, where else can people find our spooky and not so spooky content? On yeah, the so if you want to... If you want more RFR in your um, existence, we do have a Facebook main page. Uh, we also have a Facebook support group page. So that's also where you can get additional support. Also... You will find out about additional support groups on the support group page. And then we have our main page. You can keep up, up to date what's going on with Recovering from Religion. We are on the artist formerly known as Twitter, now X, um, at RFR.org. We are on Instagram. And we are also on the TikToks. And uh, we're on YouTube, too. So that's where all these you see all these wonderful talks. In case you missed them, we're there. So um, please consider doing other socials. Um, do liking and sharing and subscribing and um, ringing bells and hearting and all, all the things because that gets um, engagement up and directs people to us. So please do that. It really does help. Okay, y'all. Now, we talked about, you know, all the wonderful things we do at RFR. And, you know, this is the cool, cool kids place. But if you really want to be 20% cooler, you want to become a volunteer. Now, the reason why you become a volunteer, because um, you want to be part of the Cool Kids Club. <laughs> but also as well, um, I am known that I have found um, in the three, it's a little over three years since I've been um, volunteering with Recovering From Religion, that has bring, brought a lot of purpose and meaning into my life. Um, I formed some really wonderful, caring friendships here. Um, I'm, I always feel like I'm doing something purposeful and brings meaning into my life um, just by helping others. So we are always looking for volunteers. Um, and there are all sorts of jobs. You don't, um, you can be like us and super vocal, like me and Car, that we like, we, we're healthy narcissists and like attention. <laughs> And so you can do that. Um, you can be an agent or you can do stuff behind the scenes, um, hosting support groups, um, finding resources, um, supporting the online community, IT support. We're, and we're, we're looking for web developers. So if you are tech savvy, please consider volunteering with us. It would be deeply appreciated. So what you're going to do, you're going to go to recoveryfromreligion.org dash volunteer and file an application. Now, I want to point out, point out to y'all <laughs> that the minimum is four hours a month, <laughs> okay? Now, you can be like us and get absorbed because once you, it, it's kind of like Pringles or it's a lace. Lace, once you pop, it can't stop. 
No, that's Pringles. <laughs> I think that's Pringles. The Pringles. Yeah. Okay. It's Pringles. So once you pop, you can't stop it. Like you're going to be here all the time. But if there's only so much you can do a month, we will take whatever you can offer and do. If you think there's something that you could improve upon, please share that because we're always looking for new ideas and new ways that we can um, expand our outreach and um and um, support our mission of offering hope, healing, and support of those dealing with doubt and non-belief. So um, please consider becoming a volunteer. Okay. I shilt, Kara. Your turn. Well done. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Uh, always, always an excellent job at that. And now we have reached the end of our program, and we are going to have some final words to wrap us up and take us to the hangout by the fantastic Jason, who you may recognize from previous episodes. Jason, what are your thoughts on this evening's show? Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to thank you, Ember, for being here. Um, and sharing your story. I, I totally, I, I think there's so much value. And as you talked about viewing our life as a series of transitions, um, figuring out who we are, as opposed to, we are all static in one position and at one place and just being happy and justifying our place in that, in the world. Um, so I really, I'm really happy to hear that. And I totally agree with you that there's so much natural overlap between people breaking out of religion and other marginalized communities, um, paying attention to who's specifically harmed, um, giving as much safe haven to people to ask their own questions and then feel safe to express themselves however they want. Um, just really happy with the presentation you gave and um, so happy you're here. So I think everyone can benefit from this stuff. You know, I, I'm born straight, uh, born cis, and I still have get so much value out of hearing people's liberation stories, um, figuring out what, what bad data I downloaded from my society and had to start questioning. Um, and what allyship really looks like. So I want to thank you again for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. It's 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 great to be able to talk about these things because there's there's so few places. Like it's so easy to 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 look at our little bubbles in in the internet, particularly on YouTube, where we have you know a few channels that we tend to frequent and hang out with and and so on. But in the grander scheme of things. It's really only those few places. It's sort of like that idea that the universe was designed specifically for life, and yet we only find life on a fraction of one tiny planet around one relatively average star. It seems like a lot while you're here, while you're in, in the mix of things, but when you perceive the greater sphere of things, there's not that much. And so it's really, really important for every organization that can every person who can stand up and be seen to everybody to try to help each other and and work together to build a better tomorrow